Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Kendra McClure. I'm with OSA Management, and I'll be your room monitor. If at any time you need assistance during the session, please use the chat functionality to grab my attention. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes to help you familiarize yourself with Zoom. First, for any questions that you might have, please use the question and answer box. If you see a question that you also want answered, please use the thumbs up or the up like button to prioritize it in the queue. As a reminder, this webinar room will close at the end of the session, so please visit the schedule to visit each Zoom room individually. And last, NSF, NSF will be sending you a survey in the next few days. We value your feedback and really appreciate that you're here. And now, without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce this session's presider, William Oliver. Thank you, Kendra. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. This, this session is on building a quantum engineering major uh, slash minor. I guess this is a culmination of the last two days, and this is where we get to ask questions like, what are the minimum uh, set of skills that quantum engineers need during their undergraduate education, and uh, what curricula are realistic and affordable in different university and four-year college uh, environments? So this is, this is gonna be a great discussion. And um, before we kick it off, there's a first poll question that we'd like to post here. Um, it should come up in just a moment. And, and basically this poll is going to, yeah, here it is, um, to indicate if you or your colleagues or someone you know is developing a quantum engineering curriculum. And so here it's just multiple choice. Um, and later before the panel discussion, We'll have a related question, but we'll ask for more details that we can put into the Google Doc link, and that'll be provided again. And so without further ado, uh, let me say, uh, uh, let me introduce um, our first speaker. And uh, she's Sophia Ikanomu uh, from Virginia Polytech Institute and State University. And she'll tell us about developing practical um, QISE education at the undergraduate level. And so with that, um, Sophia, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation and organizing this very nice and interesting and timely workshop. So, uh, as Will said, I'm going to be focusing on undergraduate education in my talk, and then we'll hear from uh, Bob Joints about uh, graduate level. So these are the questions uh, to address with the help of uh, Lincoln. Uh, this is what uh, we formulated for this panel. So I'll go linearly and I'll focus more on the second question, which is about um, building a, a curriculum, a program for undergraduate education. And the other uh, questions I will touch upon, but I think will be discussed more by other panelists in this session. So the first question was, uh, does quantum engineering require its own department or should it be implemented as a specialized track in existing engineering disciplines? So we all recognize that this is an extremely diverse topic. It uh, is very interdisciplinary. It ranges from very, very practical considerations in material science, uh, all the way to very abstract th theory. So all these different types of expertise fit within the umbrella of QISC. Uh, but it's very hard to decide which out of these people should be together in a department. And uh, in my view, it is very difficult to rationalize why we should do that. So I have here some examples of kind of uh, topics within QISC and types of expertise needed. And this list, list is by no means exhaustive at all. So uh, in superconducting qubits, of course, you need experimentalists, RF engineers, physicists, uh, theorists who do quantum error correction, specialized quantum error correction for that particular platform. Uh, similarly, uh, quantum algorithms experts, since this platform is quite far along compared to some of the others. Then uh, another example is quantum network science, where uh, you can view this like a very theoretical topic involving theory of communication, which is covered in many uh, WEN ECE departments, but usually it's covered at uh, probably the graduate level in the depth that you would want. Um, it also involves classical network theory, and then on the quantum side, entanglement, cryptography, et cetera. But then if you want to actually implement networks, of course, you need uh, people who do experiments, who identify and uh, improve quantum emitters, 
who package things into devices, who understand uh, optics and quantum photonics, transduction, etc. So even if you chose one of these three, and then similarly for sensing, these are three examples within the very vast um, topic of quantum information science and engineering. So even if you chose one of these, uh, I think this would be a very disparate group of people that you would kind of force to be inside a department. And in some sense, you would still have a very narrow department. So a very kind of short answer to this question, my personal view is that creating your uh, separate department is not uh, very well motivated, at least not at this point. Now, in building a curriculum, of course, not having a specific department does not preclude us from forming a high quality and meaningful cur curriculum that the students can be, you know, the students who graduate from it can advance into good careers. So I think the key here is to leverage existing resources and programs and uh, to select future investments uh, carefully because a lot of the, especially experimental on the experimental side, um, the equipment is quite expensive. And then finally, there's the interesting possibility of shared facilities. So um, what kind of expertise is absolutely necessary? The field is still at its very early stage, contrary to what sometimes one would think by reading the press. So still having a very firm grasp of the fundamentals is key. We can't just uh, you know, look at the top level of the stack and ignore everything going under it. And I think for students to actually have meaningful, um, you know, uh, cultivate meaningful expertise, you do need them to go to kind of the very fundamentals. For, for example, using specialized programming software, it's is a great way to enter kind of the field, especially for young education and outreach and to peak students' excitement, but just having that as your expertise would become some obsolete quick, quickly, I would think. And then, uh, yeah, the idea is, I think, to, to use and leverage the tools that are provided by industry, which is really great tools, and I don't mean to in any way, um, uh, you know, uh, say the opposite, but to this low level of knowledge, kind of academic, if you will, is still very important. And then domain expertise would complement the quantum skills developed. Of course, there's many challenges. As I already mentioned, cost is one. So the experimental setups are expensive. There exist now many companies that have uh, ready demos uh, that people can you know, use in their teaching. We are at Virginia Tech, we're pur purchasing some of those. Uh, but then for other things like, you know, having, doing experiments at still fridges, uh, I think that's out of the question for a typical university. So then there's the question of, are there shared facilities we could think of, maybe at the state level, maybe leveraging uh, national labs or industry. Then, of course, you need teaching staff. Not everybody can teach uh, in a quantum curriculum. And it's also challenging to create a meaningful curriculum, given how broad the field is. And then there's additional challenges at the graduate level, but I'm going to skip over this since we have uh, Bob Joint's talk and the panel discussion. So quantum information science and engineering is one of the most interdisciplinary fields, which is both a great opportunity and a big challenge in creating uh, degrees. And I think uh, many people have uh, kind of uh, horror stories of trying to create an interdisciplinary program. And some of the reasons this is difficult is that it can be too restrictive to try to force uh, different uh, subtopics inside a curriculum. Students typically come from diverse backgrounds, especially if we're thinking about a minor, which is mainly what I'll be talking about, but also a graduate degree. Because at that point, students either have their major or their undergraduate degree, and they're already uh, part of a uh, particular expertise and culture. And then uh, there can be a hell in trying to figure out prerequisite. Um, we have some experience uh, with this at Virginia Tech and I've talked to people who are doing things like uh, nanoscience degrees where you have people from bio biology as well as physics interested and everybody has taken different type of courses, different math expertise, et cetera. So considering all these issues, I think we will have to think about specialization and we should think about it as a positive, not a negative, because 
the field is very broad and we want expertise on many different uh, of the uh, topics that QISE covers. So not everyone can or sh even should be taught everything, it's impossible. And I think there is a little bit of resistance by people who consider some courses absolutely necessary in their field. But in, in a degree like this, students might never see them and that, that's absolutely fine. So for example, um, QAC students might have a good, strong undergraduate degree and never solve the hydrogen atom, right? A typical physicist who's not in this field might uh, consider this unacceptable that you're doing something that has quantum in the name and you're not solving this very prototypical problem. But uh, th this is just not necessary for everything, for every single thing you might want to do in quantum. So some students will not touch experiments. There will be theoretical uh, people who are uh, more trained as theorists, which is also fine. And some students will not take e &M, which uh, I think to physicists and engineers, this can also be shocking. So this is a, just some examples, but there's a long list of courses that in a traditional curriculum would be considered absolutely must and don't have necessarily a reason to be as uh, to be mandatory in a quantum core, uh, curriculum. But at the same time, there are fundamentals that everybody should know. And uh, I want to give you a little bit of a feel of what we are doing. So we're in the process of doing the paperwork for the minor. We're hoping to launch it in the fall. That's a little bit of ag aggressive, uh, but we think we can have the first students uh, uh, enrolling in, in the fall semester. So luckily we had a lot of multidisciplinary interests. So there's seven departments and programs involved. That gives us an opportunity for an interdisciplinary program. But um, for me, the key feature is to provide flexibility and avoid all these issues with prerequisites, people with different expertise, trying to force them in a, a, to take courses that are not, you know, they don't have the background for. And the way we have uh, created this degree is uh, such that students can tailor it to their interests and the, their background. But at the same time, we are putting some absolutely uh, necessary knowledge, building it in as mandatory courses. And that is linear algebra, programming, and uh, quantum computing and quantum communications fundamentals. So this is the structure kind of in a nutshell. Uh, we, of course, need linear algebra and we are putting one of the uh, two linear, the, the more advanced of the two linear algebra courses that most STEM students have to take anyway. Programming is very important. So we are creating a course that's uh, called Programming Classical and Quantum Computers. So there we are viewing this as an opportunity to teach students how to use software broader than just programming quantum computers. So an important thing is using col collaborative software um, using GitHub, learning how to create uh, code uh, in a collaborative fashion that can be built upon. So that we, we consider that these skills are actually much broader than just being used in quantum. And even if students end up doing something else that's not related to quantum in the end, these are skills that will benefit them. Uh, and then of course, there will be a component here of using hardware uh, that are available in the cloud and also programming quantum computers. And then uh, we will uh, begin a quantum computing and information concepts course at the freshman level. So I, I'll talk about that quite a bit. And then we have a quantum information technologies course, which is hardware agnostic. So it's a more kind of proper formal version of this third one. And that is the senior level. So the, these courses are created in a way that you don't need any prerequisites other than linear algebra to take them and linear algebra is one of them. So it's very self-contained. Then to enforce more quantumness into the curriculum, we have a very short list of electives which are quantum oriented and they have a flavor of either hardware or software. So this is where you would put the hardware. So there's a course here that's about different platforms, how to control them. There you go into the physics of the devices, Rabi oscillations, time dependent, quantum mechanics, etc. Uh, and if students don't want to do that, that's fine. We also have a more advanced quantum software course. So the, it's an even more advanced version than this last one over here. So for example, a computer science student might not want to know, uh, you know, 
the basics of the hardware or the physics of the hardware, we go quite a bit depth in here. And this course, the hardware one does have quantum mechanics as a prereq. So you can avoid, again, having to take a physics or uh, a chemistry course or an applied physics course, et cetera, by taking the software one. And then we have a very long list of uh, electives. They are separated in two categories, and these are designed to provide domain expertise that is relevant. So, for example, quantum mechanics is in list three, um, so that students can also leverage their their uh, major degree. So they don't have to take you know only new courses, and they can use part of their major as counting toward the minor. There's a fifty percent rule, and all that has been taken into account. And then finally, we have an optional project where they can choose between doing research with someone, uh, an academic and national lab or industry. And then we're also putting an outreach component here uh, because Virginia Tech is one of the universities that contributes a lot to uh, physics teachers, uh, produces uh, a good amount of phys physics teachers at the high school level. So uh, the structure of this curriculum allows us to build unofficial spe specializations. And these are enforced by a structure and it's quite natural what a student would take based on their majors. So I have here some examples. There's an experimental, we don't call them tracks because they're not official, but an experimental flavor, a cryptography flavor, a chemistry, uh, even a machine learning. And then you can build many more specializations than what I show here. So I wanna say in the last few minutes uh, that I have left, a little bit about uh, this freshman course that we uh, are creating, which I think is uh, a little bit different than what uh, is available out there. So the idea is to focus on applications and concepts first before bombarding students with formalism. So that's why we want this to be a freshman course. We're using the pictorial approach from uh, Terry Rudolph's book, Cues for Quantum. So this requires no advanced math whatsoever, but it's rigorous. So we're using this course to build toward linear algebra. And then we also use the drag and drop interface. So we're also hoping that without the need for advanced math already or coding experience, we can attract a broader uh, set of students. So this is how this pictorial formalism look, looks like. You have the zero and one represented by white and black uh, marbles. And you have these boxes that represent uh, quantum gates and you um, show them the not gates, see not gate, swap, et cetera, and the Hadamard gate. And you denote the superposition as two different values of the uh, marbles inside a cloud. So the cloud means superposition, and those are separated by, by com. And the first chapter, by the way, from Terry's book is available for free online, so you can uh, read about this. And we also have a paper on this, so I'll link it in a moment. Um, then we are developing more games like this. So we're developing games that showcase a particular concept or algorithm in quantum by using uh, kind of a real world scenario, even if it's kind of whimsical like this one. So this is something my colleague at Barnes has developed at Virginia Tech and it's called Money or Tiger. So the idea is that you have one of these three scenarios shown here and you have this bo uh, button here that can open both doors at once. You're not allowed to open each one separate and you're also uh, allowed to use this tiger box but you can only use it once. So the tiger box let lets you query uh, the white or the black door. And classically, this problem has no solution if you want to be absolutely 100% safe from being attacked by the tiger. But quantum mechanically, you probably recognize this is Deutsch's algorithm. You can build a circuit that with one try uh, lets you distinguish between the two cases that have the tiger versus this one. And of course, if there's a tiger, you just walk away. Otherwise, you collect the money. So we're in the process of building more uh, things like this to add to this course. And uh, concepts you can teach with this, again, no linear algebra at all, is uh, simple quantum algorithms. You can teach the concept of entanglement, quantum teleportation, non-cloning theorem, measuring in different bases, QKD, entanglement swapping, which can lead you to quantum repeaters, et cetera. And then we will use this to go from this uh, uh, you know, pictorial approach to introducing a vector and introducing the vector structure of the Hilbert space and the tensor product then will be kind of natural because you'll have superpositions with two instead of one ball here 
And we think this is a much friendlier way to lead toward linear algebra instead of starting with uh, the formal, the mathematical formulas. So uh, this is just a summary of the degree. And then the last question, I think I have maybe one more minute, uh, is how do we increase diversity? I think Thomas is gonna say much more about this. Uh, we, we have a lot of opportunity. There's so much out there online. At the same time, I think we have to be careful about how some of these resources are marketed so that they appeal to a broader audience. And we have done quite a bit of outreach. We have worked with uh, underrepresented groups and female students. Uh, this is pre-COVID uh, good old times. And we're continuing our efforts online and we're essentially using the uh, formulas I showed you with the high school students with the boxes and the, and the clouds. And we've also done the same actually for a few middle, middle school students and they seem to grasp the concept, concepts very well. So you can read more about our approach in this paper. And that, that's it. Great, thank you very much, Sophia. I really appreciate that talk. And um, I'd encourage um, listeners to start putting questions in the question and answer um, panel. Um, and we'll now hear from our three panel speakers. Um, let me remind the panel speakers that they have only five minutes each but we'll have you know, ample opportunity to respond to questions and expound upon their ideas um, in the panel session. And um, to kick things off, uh, I'd like to introduce Charlie Bennett with IBM Research. Charlie, please take it away. And start my video and find the right screen here. Uh, yes. Share screen. Okay, what's happening here? Let's see. Have you? Oh yeah, I've got. I've got to. Yes, here we go. Share this screen. Okay, I think I'm. Okay, now. Oh, I see this. Okay, sure, share it now. Okay, good. we're going to go up to the top here. So, uh, can you put it into full screen mode? Uh, yes, yeah, so that. Yeah, I want to do that. Yes. Okay. Okay, and I get rid of this chat window here. Yeah. Okay, take it away. Okay, good. So, uh, uh, I'm. Uh, what I have to say is a little pitch towards towards even the earlier uh, before lunch uh, session, uh, but the but I think my main point is that uh, in order to get people good at quantum mechanics and, and inventive in the field, we need to start really early because the quantum intuition is so different from what anyone is is used to. Uh, and I, I've always said that we have to, actually I've, I've been echoed, or uh, I'm, I'm echoing many of the speakers what we've always said, but begin to really early, even in, in, uh, in uh, elementary school. Uh, and I think that people who, and again, echoing the earlier speakers, uh, in order to keep it simple while building the quantum intuition, we need to use the, we should use the quantum information framework and not the traditional quantum mechanics of, of physics departments. Uh, and so we have to really concentrate on the simplest and strangest things, the superposition principle uh, and how it leads to entanglement and how this really leads to what we now regard as the proper foundation, not only for, for uh, physics and chemistry, but for any kind of interaction and indeed the whole understanding of the relation of the whole to the parts. And, and this is something that liberal arts majors should, should understand in the, in the same way that an educated person understands in a, in a rough way what, what Einstein found out about space and time. But then we can go on to all these, these uh, uh, more complicated things. Uh, and I'll just give a hint of how I pitch this thing to uh, not to uh, kindergartners, but to, but to uh, lay people who have, have no familiarity with, with any kind of 
science, but maybe took some math in high school. So I say how quantum information is different. Everybody knows about ordinary information. You don't have to tell them, but quantum information is like the information in a dream. Uh, you, you, when you describe your dream, you, that changes your memory of it. And you, you don't remember the dream, just what you said about it. And then I go on and I say, but unlike dreams that obeys well-known laws and the laws of quantum mechanics can be put on one slide, the superposition principle. And I, once we can get people to understand that principle, which really involves just a little bit of high school math, uh, then they are, you seduce them into the consequences of that principle, uh, which is the strangest consequence of course is entanglement. And I, I prefer to illustrate it with polarized photons because their orthogonality of states is orthogonality of directions uh, rather than say the block sphere, uh, which is, is a little counterintuitive for, for beginners. Uh, and we don't even need a complex numbers at this stage. And then I point out the thing that wasn't really realized until very late, which is the parallel between classical and quantum information processing. Uh, and then I started talking about entanglement and what an entangled state is and, and uh, you know, how it's a state of sameness of the parts, even though each, each part is not in a definite state of its own. It's this, the, the, when Schrodinger discovered this, he, he, ex, he emphasized it with three exclamation points. Uh, and I said, well, this seems like a very uh, uh, new age idea of uh, being completely random and completely correlated with everybody else. But the mathematics of it is, is kind of fascinating and it's, it's even parallel to some things in social interactions, the monogamy of entanglement and how if two parties become entangled and then one of them tries to become entangled to a third party, the entanglement is degraded to correlated randomness, which is actually was covered by a novel uh, by Colette in 1929. Okay, so this is what my path for seducing lay people or, or uh, middle schoolers into quantum mechanics. But then if you want to go into quantum mechanics and do it as a profession, then you go on to the other things and it can go as far as, as, as uh, the wild west of quantum mechanics like black hole information paradox. So I think that's a good place to stop. Great, thank you, Charlie. And again, I encourage people to uh, enter questions uh, in the Q&A and we'll address them uh, once the panel session starts. But first, um, we'd like to hear from Bob Joint uh, from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Uh, Bob, please take it away. Oh, Bob, uh, we can see the slides, but we can't hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep, sounds great. Good. Okay, I'm gonna share my, uh, our experiences at uh, Wisconsin with a master's program that we started a couple of years ago. I've had a lot of help in creating this from my faculty and staff colleagues. Um, let's see, there we go. Um, so we started this about, started uh, the paperwork and so forth about two years ago, and uh, we graduated our, graduated our first class of uh, six students last August. We currently have uh, 12 students enrolled in this year's class, and uh, we're doing the admissions process now for next year's class. We expect about 80 applications by the March 5th deadline, and um, so we think we'll have ramped up to a class of about 15 to 18 that will enroll next fall. So here um, are the goals and uh, how we're trying to achieve them. Our master's program, uh, we try to attract uh, students from all STEM, back, uh, all STEM backgrounds. And uh, we are trying to produce students that can hit the job market right away if that's what they wanna do or if they're using a master's program just to make their PhD application look better, we hope we can be useful to them too. Uh, it's an accelerated program. Uh, we, it's designed at least to get students uh, through in one year. Uh, they can do two years if they want. Maybe they get an internship or something and want to stretch things out. 
uh, that's fine too. Uh, so far, uh, we do have a few students who are doing that this year. Uh, we try to provide a well-rounded classroom uh, introduction to quantum computing, uh, and uh, it includes both hardware and software. I'll go into a little more detail about that. Uh, lab experience, something that uh, the students want and employers definitely want, they say that. Um, and then some exposure to research. Uh, just a little more detail. So we have three required courses. Um, I teach this one. So it's quantum mechanics of two level systems and tensor products of such systems and measurement theory. So you teach quantum mechanics, that's all the quantum mechanics you teach. And some of the students are coming in without having, some of the students are coming in without having seen um, any quantum mechanics before. And so uh, that's, uh, that's what they need, we find, to, to do this. Actually, it works surprisingly well. Then circuits, algorithms, error correction. Uh, then they do a quantum mechanics course and electives. Uh, the spring course, uh, they learn about quantum computers that are not perfect machines. And um, the second half of that course has to do with implementations of quantum mechanics that are going to be done in the lab course in the summer. And uh, so um, that's an intense eight week course in which they do eight labs. And then finally, uh, at the end there, they um, turn in their report uh, on whatever research project they got involved with. Uh, this I won't uh, uh, this I won't go into a, uh, in any detail, don't have the time. Um, these are the eight labs that they do. Uh, all of them have some relevance to quantum, mechanics, uh, quantum computing. Um, this, of course, is very challenging. We spent about $75,000 and invested quite a bit of faculty time, which is a scarce resource uh, in the development of the, this uh, laboratory course. So this is, the, uh, this is the last course they take then. Uh, so let me uh, finish up by just talking about uh, what we saw as the main challenges in advance, uh, some of the things that popped up that we didn't really uh, anticipate and how we dealt with those things. So the first thing I, which I think we did know we we're gonna have to deal with was the very diverse levels of student preparation. So each of the students has an advisor that uh, tailors their program so that they can fill in the holes and also do things that uh, they're particularly interested in. There's a dedicated teaching assistant who can help with all their courses, even the non-quantum computing ones. Um, but basically you take advantage of the fact, which I mentioned before, that the amount of quantum mechanics you need to know uh, to do this um, is not as much as you might think. Um, we have team building exercises for the students. Um, we have dedicated office space, very grateful to my department for providing that. Uh, and this helps the students to learn from each other. Uh, the labs, um, we were lucky we had you know, quite a few advanced uh, undergraduate and graduate labs already there that we could update and modify. We do in the summer when that stuff is available. Uh, it turns out to be very difficult to find faculty to teach in the summer because that's when they usually don't want to teach. The biggest thing we didn't really anticipate is that the students were going to want a lot of exposure to research. And this is tricky for a number of reasons. One is that you have to have uh, packaged sort of projects that you can uh, reasonably expect the students to do in one year, uh, less than one year. Uh, and make some, some contribution. Uh, and the bigger problem is that it's a, it's a burden on the faculty uh, and we're trying to figure out ways to lessen that. For example, by having the students form teams uh, so as to have uh, more students get through with fewer projects. Okay, let me stop there. Great, thank you very much, Bob. And finally, I'd like to uh, introduce Thomas Searles uh, from Howard University. Um, Thomas, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, I will do my best to meet the five minute requirement. Um, <clears throat> but please feel free to reach out to me at my email. Um, so today I'd like to, to give my best talk about um, ways of building a diverse, open and inclusive quantum smart workforce, um, mostly behind things that we've done um, with respect to um, IBM's Quantum Center, um, which I am happen to be the director of. Um, and we hosted at Howard University. At Howard, we have a particular emphasis on 
providing unique educational opportunities for black students. Um, and in particular, we pride ourselves on producing leaders um, like Madam Vice President, which we have here. Um, there's a large history of producing African American leaders in the civil rights movement, politics, but also in science and engineering. Um, like many HBCUs that you see listed in this top 10, um, we are effective producers of undergraduates um, that go on to pursue graduate degrees in STEM. And Howard has been a leader for a very long time in this space. Um, and within the IBM HBCU Quantum Center, we include most of the schools um, that you see listed as the top producers. And in particular, um, I like to highlight that this is not a new problem or it's a problem that's been around this concept of um, bringing diversity to STEM. Um, in particular, here's pictured is Professor Herman Branson, um, who I am hoping to fill um, some very large shoes in the context that he posed this problem in the American Journal of Physics um, with respect to the war effort. Um, so to put it in the context, 80 years after slavery, um, about 85 years or so after the first PhD was awarded to a black person in physics, um, Herman Branson, a few years earlier in 1940, was the fifth person to get his PhD in physics. Um, and he, he wrote this paper, um, which resonates a lot with respect to the quantum initiative in today's effort. And in particular, um, speaking about the role of HBCUs, um, he says that it's not more, it's not a point of um, HBCUs getting their fair share of federal funding. Um, but it's more of HBCUs acting as American institutions, uh, fulfilling their responsibility to American citizens. And we at the IBM HBCU Quantum Center, um, which has now grown as of Monday to 23 institutions, we share that same vision. Um, and about 100 or 60 or so years later, um, from going to 1940s to now in 2021, we want to shape this in the form of quantum information. Um, so what we'd like to do um, is also point out that we're reaching parts of the nation that the other QLCIs and then the Department of Energy Quantum Information Science Centers are not currently reaching this part of the country. Um, so just to answer the questions right quick and I'm more, more than excited to delve into these ideas. Um, the first is just how to increase diversity. Um, I'll list five ways here, um, but the slides will be available to everybody. And I'm more than happy to talk about each of these ideas um, in the following paper, but later on today. Um, but I just wanna highlight a couple of things. Um, the PRIM program at NSF is extremely successful. Um, I'll talk a little bit about developing pathways. Um, important within these pathways, recruitment is not enough. Uh, degree attainment is where we should really be shooting with respect to increasing or moving the needle um, for our QIS. Um, and then just two last things that are just extremely important. Um, we have to be intentional with collaborating with HBCUs and MSIs. And last but definitely not least, um, the majority of black students that go to college are black women. Um, so a lot of the efforts that emphasize women in STEM need to ha also have some remixed version or some version of it that looks like black women in STEM. If we invest in Black women in STEM, then we will automatically invest in our quantum futures. So here I just want to show that um, there's something that we can learn from computer science. Um, so this very busy graph shows that over the past 25 years, um, nothing has changed with respect to physics degrees. Um, so this is from the AIP team up report. Um, but it, around 2003, there was a substantial change in computer science. Um, so it's something to think about on um, ways that we can learn from that particular discipline. Um, for those in engineering, since this is a quantum engineering kind of scenario, engineering is not that different than physics. Um, and these are some of the things in the team up report, um, which I encourage each and every one of us to learn from physics and what, how you can create that type of um, environment in physics um, that could easily be transferred to undergraduate uh, engineering degrees, and in particular with respect to developing pathways and recruitment is not enough. Uh, there's a lot of, of emphasis on broader impacts of NSF work. There's a lot of emphasis on bridge programs. There's a lot of emphasis 
on transfer programs um, and exchange programs. However, getting the students in the door is not necessarily the issue. Um, there we have data in physics, but also in engineering from my institution, Howard University. And we're getting hundreds of physics students applying. We're admitting 50s, um, but we're only graduating in the twos and threes. Um, so it's really an issue of students admitted that go on to attend and then students that once they're there, keeping them in STEM. And last but not least, just allowing them to, uh, to attain the degree. Um, so I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but in the interest of time, I like to just keep going on um, to the most important. So what can we do to educate different university environments? Um, our center's open and ready to go. Engineering at HBCUs, there's 15 that are ABET accredited. Um, FAMU is special, they are with um, Florida State. Um, there's also an untapped resource that I think will help this specific effort out a lot. And these are these dual degree engineering programs that have been around since the 80s. Um, they're a student at an HBCU majors in something like computer science or like at Morehouse, something like applied physics. And then they go on and get their dual degree engineering program at North Carolina A&T, Howard, or places like Georgia Tech or University of Michigan. Um, so I bring that up because there are a better accredited programs in applied physics and engineering physics. Um, so this could be a tool of our, a new entryway um, for students to come from HBCUs to enter into quantum engineering. Um, so thank you so much for your attention and time and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Thomas. And uh, thank you also, Bob, Charlie, and Sophia. So we'll open it up to the panel discussion now. Um, and so I encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A uh, box, please use that. That helps us keep track of them. Before we get to the panel though, there's one more poll question that we would like to ask. If, if we could bring that up, please, Kendra. And um, this poll question, um, if you could, rather than select here, this, this introduces the question, which is, you know, you know, um, you, you know, basically responding in the Google Doc to these various items, if you could input that into the Google Doc in the link that Lincoln had provided earlier. Um, and this will help us as we develop the uh, report that we'll send to the uh, NSF and we'd like to capture this data. So with that, let's um, start the Q&A session. So th thank you very much to the um, panelists. Really appreciate um, your thoughts and comments here. And um, here's, here's a question from James uh, Freerix. And it, it, he says, it's not really a question, but a comment. Um, but it's one that I've been thinking about personally as well. In, and that is, um, how can we rethink teaching quantum in addition to what we actually teach, right? And um, this is an opportunity to do things better than we have in the past. And I, I wonder maybe if we can start with Charlie, because Charlie, you, you were talking a lot about um, the quantum concepts for science and engineering, and you had some pretty interesting ones there too in your slides. And I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what can we do different and hopefully better in teaching um, this new field, quantum engineering? Oh, Charlie, I'm sorry. I think you're still muted. Lessons for teaching in general that's come from our experience here, I think is what you, you asked. Uh, well, I think w one of my things I found very inspiring was uh, in, in, uh, this morning's, uh, or I guess earlier today, uh, talk uh, about quantum uh, games as, as the, getting people interested in it, not through book learning or well, computerized book learning that we have now, but through game play. And I think that the way that that, uh, that a video of, of, well, of course it helps to have a <laughs> Stephen Hawking in your video which is not something we can do anymore, uh, but it uh, that that took off with people in a way who didn't think they were interested in in learning about quantum quantum mechanics at all. So I think there's a tremendous amount of very important outreach beyond the ivory tower to people who, well, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, yeah. who not only who, who don't think of themselves as being interested in or capable of science, but people who don't even 
have much respect for for science or, or believe it yeah so so if i i mean that's very important in terms of 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 health of 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 a society in general yeah so so, so i would say trying to find different media of, of of getting through to people that that are not even don't even look like uh, a course of 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 a school great would, would other panelists like to comment on this Uh, I, I agree that the concepts and applications first approach helps a lot. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's necessary for physics students, for example, because quantum is part of their curriculum, they're going to do it. Perhaps for, you know, people who are going to take quantum mechanics as a mandatory course anyway, uh, more emphasis on entanglement. I think a lot of courses might never even ca cover entanglement. <laughs> Uh, uh, for for quantum, I'm hoping that's not the case anymore. I have an experience that's quite dated from my personal experience now. Giving a much more sort of short-term perspective um, of how to say get people into the workforce who uh, don't know much about quantum uh, but want to you know do something which is relevant to quantum. Uh, I think this this success that I, I feel like we have had where you can teach enough quantum mechanics, you know, in a month or two, in the first half of a one semester course, to really kind of get people going. Um, I think that's a, uh, that's something in the very short term that we can use for that particular population. Great, and and Thomas, I have a question here for you. But before I get to that, I was wondering, do you have anything to add to this, given um, the the um, role or the opportunities that you've had with the IBM quantum experience and being a member of that team and you know in what ways has that IBM quantum experience um, enabled you to introduce students in a different way than a standard class I wonder if you could just maybe comment on that a little bit too yeah most definitely um, so in one of the slides I glossed over but hopefully people could take a look at it uh, it talks about how um, to bring hands-on activities into the classroom um, so I was able to do that um, last semester, um, teaching a modern physics course. Um, we did a unit after the um, quantum mechanics or quantum phenomenon section of like a survey modern physics book um, using Qiskit, um, using IBM computers with a final project. Um, so it's a way of not ruffling the feathers of the administration and the department, um, but to, to, so you won't have to go through all these committees to get some quantum information into your course. Um, but something that we're trying to do is to look throughout and to reinforce ideas of programming in Python, um, what a quantum circuit looks like, how can we use that, um, even when we're introducing logic circuits. So things like that are things that we're trying to do within the center with IBM's help. Yeah, and in, I'm curious, in your course evaluations, um, did you get feedback from the students on this? And, and what was, you know, what are some testimonials that you heard? Yeah, so the, the unfortunate part about, um, and I don't know if it was just my shared, my only experience or if it's shared throughout people that have taught in COVID, um, but <laughs> it seemed that uh, the, the students enjoyed the project-based learning. Um, I lost about half of them, I would say, in trying to do this remote that I hope that I wouldn't if it was an in-person type of thing. Um, yeah. And then the main feedback was that I was nice, but I think that other people would say that I'm not very nice. So I think it was just that I'm not being mean to people in COVID. <laughs> it makes me look nice in comparison. Thanks. And before I ask the question that came up specifically for you, I wanted to let Sophia and Bob maybe respond on the uh, evaluations that you've received in your, I guess, Sophie, is yours starting this fall. So let me um, ask that to Bob, you know, the evaluations that you've received so far, what works and what doesn't work? Um, well, uh, I think the, the students who have felt that certain things didn't work, um, were students where we weren't able to sort of meet the challenge of this very diverse preparation that people had. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of get got thrown into physics courses for which they just um, 
weren't that well prepared and maybe really weren't that interested because you know they're more interested in the quantum computing kind of thing. Uh, so in our case, I think um, it's worked well for the students who um, you know are kind of on a straight course and they knew uh, they knew what they were getting into. Others just fell out of their depth. Uh, although that's been a minority. Okay, I see. Thanks. So, so this is the question that came up um, specifically for Thomas, but I think we'd like everybody to respond. And um, I think you had a slide where you showed some statistics. And, and the question here is, do you find that students leaving physics and quantum engineering are moving into other STEM fields or are they tending to leave STEM altogether? Yeah, and I'd, I'd like other people to, to give theirs in there. So I'll be very short. Um, for a lot of our students, um, we can admit them, but we can't get them in the door. So that's number one. That's our biggest issue. Um, and then once we get them in the door, making that transition past the first year courses to the second year courses, has just always been historically a problem in physics. Um, now, where do they go for sadly, they don't stay in STEM. Um, I don't know if that's just a Howard thing or an HBCU thing. But once the students have these bad experiences early on, they propagate through the rest of their lives. Um, so a lot of times when you hear why a student is a physics student, it's because they had that one physics high school teacher that changed their lives. Um, but at the same time, you have to think about all of the high school teachers that are changing lives in other ways. Um, and then trying to, to convince our students early on that they're capable and able and they are needed to do something like this. Um, so that's what we're currently working on with the team up report. Um, but we're, we're finding that a lot of black students specifically, once they leave STEM, they leave it all together. I see. Sophia, what do you find at Virginia Tech uh, in your experience? So I don't have too much experience uh, yet with freshmen and uh, early because my course, the existing course I'm teaching in quantum is what will be the advanced course uh, in, as part of the minor. So I get to see students around junior and senior year. Um, I, I don't have directly something to say about that, but I think what could help is having these uh, summer camps to prepare uh, students to transition from high school to college. And I know that uh, the Oregon, um, you know, Mike is also here. They have uh, some programs like that. And we're also looking into, um, you know, adapting something like this so that we can help students prepare them. And I think a big part of it is giving them more confidence. Sometimes they're very good, but they're not as confident as some of their, um, you know, white male counterparts. And Bob, did you want to respond to this uh, from the Madison perspective? Well, uh, the statistics uh, so far are just way too small for me to have any, uh, mm. you know, useful uh, feedback about how the students would do if they came in. Um, I do have something to say about uh, why they might not be coming in. When I uh, proposed this program to the university administration, the, the said the only way you can do it is if it's uh, it's a revenue generating program, which means we have to charge high tuition. So they come in one year, they have to pay $48,000. And that's going to, you know, that's going to eliminate a lot of people. And I, this is something I, uh, I just feel terrible about. And we're trying to figure out how to get scholarships and so forth. But, you know, it's, a, yeah, it's one of these structural problems, right? Right. So related to this in terms of, you know, filling the pipeline and getting more people in, of course, you know, there is this structural issue. But Another question that came up, and Charlie, I'd be curious to hear what you think about this, is um, what, what can we do? The, the question here basically is what experiences do exist of, about the introduction of these ideas in community colleges, and how may they be translated to other places? And so maybe even expanding on that, what can we do in the high school and the community college level to make um, a program in quantum engineering at the undergraduate level more successful? Uh, I don't have any direct experience with that. My main experience is just talking to, to lay audiences when I give lectures. Uh, 
you know, I have not, not any experience teaching in, in community colleges. Uh, but the, I think that the, the uh, thing that helps people overcome, uh, well, the, the, our field operates under the tremendous handicap that Einstein didn't like it. <laughs> and everybody says, if Einstein, if it was too hard for Einstein, how can I understand it? So, I mean, you you can even use that as as like your 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 what the stand up comedian says first to, to warm up the audience. Uh, I I don't I I think that that would be the way to, way to go. I mean, you 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 can't say, oh, it's really much. It's much simpler than you think. You got, you got to bite the, uh, take the bull by the horns and say, yeah, you probably all think that this is that like much worse than rocket science, but it's 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 not any harder than rocket science, and it's way more interesting. Uh, you know, something like that. Yeah. Well, that leads me to another question, basically of my own that I've been struggling with at MIT as we're thinking about these programs as well, and that is. Um, and it's related to the earlier question someone asked about, you know, should we rethink how we teach? And I, I think we should. Um, and, you know, what, what kind of abstractions can we make from, you know, the way we've traditionally taught quantum physics to a new field like quantum engineering? You know, what, what kind of abstractions can we make and, and textbooks can we write that help to make a new field called quantum engineering, as opposed to, you know, taking a class here and a class there and then just saying, hey, take these two classes. In fact, you know, distilling out the key information and perhaps teaching it in a different way, which is, I think, partially what you're suggesting, Charlie. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any, I don't know, anything more that you'd like to say on that topic? Well, I guess I was reading one of the questions which uh, I was trying to compose an answer to uh, on, the, on the chat. But the question was about whether uh, uh, people are too constrained by the the limited number of, of optional courses in 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 curricula, and I think I, I want to uh, speak in favor of optional courses uh, because this whole field wouldn't have got started except for that kind of thing, and I I can give two examples, some of the earliest uh, uh, quantum uh, understanding that quantum information was 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 the right was the right foundation for information processing it was a, it was it could do more with it and instead of instead of quantum effects being a handicap for information process they were they were uh, opening a new vista was from uh, Stephen Wiesner who who was working I think he was working on uh, uh, some projects at, at, at Columbia University and started thinking in a way, he was a physicist, but he was thinking about information as a, as, and thinking things that you could do with quantum systems for information processing uh, that you couldn't do with Shannon's information, which was, at the time was only 20 years old. And one of his inventions that's well known as the quantum money, that, that, that banknotes that can't be, can't be forged. And so that came from an interdisciplinary way of thinking when, when nobody would have taken the two ideas or three ideas that were necessary to put, to come up with that as part of a, a, a university course anywhere. Another uh, more recent example, I think is Peter Shore. He was, he, he, he was somebody who was in, 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 in mathematics and computer science, but for the hell of it, he took a physics course at one time, and he started thinking about uh, you know what, what what that could do. So uh, it's very important to have, and, and and certainly my own experience taking taking. I was a physicist, but I took a, a course in mathematical logic when I was in, in graduate school, and if I hadn't been allowed to, to do that, maybe uh, you know I I would have had a less you know less imagination. <laughs> So I, I, I can't say what should we do about it, except that if you want to get people with, with new ideas, let them take courses outside your department. Fair enough. Sophia, what would you? Yeah, I just wanted to double down on that. Uh, so we, the way you know, we created our degree 
has exactly that in mind that you want to make it flexible enough and you want to make it in a way that you don't constrain students that have to follow a specific, very specific track and path of courses. At the same time, you want to make it easy for some of the students so that in the sense of leveraging their major, but you don't have to. So a student that's curious, you know, from physics can take um, quantum information theory from engineering and count it as part of the degree. So there's a lot of room for exploration. That was, you know, what Charlie said is exactly what we were going for. And maybe to your first question uh, about introducing concepts, I, you know, want to again advertise the approach by uh, from Terry Rudolph's book. Uh, I have found it amazing that students can actually work out circuits. I've done it with middle school students, and they can work out circuits. They even found on their own equivalent circuits. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I was pretty amazed by what they were able to do. And this was via Zoom over one day and it was like kids of friends of mine basically that I just uh, did it to test it out to see if it's appropriate for that age. So I think a powerful approach that strips away the formalism and gives the essence. And they also have a great sense of accomplishment when you tell them you know, what it is they actually learned and were able to do on their own. Great, any other thoughts on this before we move to the next question? Bob. Um, uh, yeah, I might actually put the opposite point of view here, uh, perhaps we ought to be thinking about starting quantum science departments uh, in, in our universities. Uh, the last time this was done in science was in the 1960s with computer science departments. And I think that had remarkable consequences for uh, both the technology, the science, uh, and also the economics of our country in the past 60 years. Uh, and uh, I think we ought to start thinking about that, okay? And then those optional courses would be people, would be things that they took outside of their major in quantum science. Yeah, and do you think that, do you think that we know what to teach in that department yet? Um, or how much uh, do we know at this point? Uh, no, I don't think we, we probably really know it yet. Uh, <laughs> and so this is, this is a way of thinking big, isn't it? Uh, how would you, how would you, uh, devise an integrated approach to this subject. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? My worry with that is that the field is just too large and too diverse and whatever you end up creating would be ad hoc and probably work with whoever you have there as faculty. I think it's a very, very hard thing to engineer and create it in a way that's, it, it, it'll never be, um, you know, um, general enough to cover all the important things. I, I, at least at this point, maybe things will change a lot in 10 years, but it's very, very hard to imagine. Yeah, well, it certainly will evolve. And yeah, I, as I said, I'm still myself thinking about, you know, how to distill this down or abstract it down into the key concepts that we need to teach. Because like you said, today, it's just too broad, there's too much. And, and I'm trying to figure out for myself, does that mean there really is just too much there? Or does it mean that we just haven't figured out, we haven't diagonalized that matrix yet uh, so that we know um, what, what the key points are, right? That we do need to teach in a new discipline like quantum engineering. Well, but you might put yourself back in the 60s and people are starting to think about computer science departments and they're thinking, well, you know, there's some math people who are interested in that, maybe some electrical engineers and uh, uh, some communications people and and you know, uh, it would have been very nebulous at that time, you know, and yet people somehow managed to do it. Yeah, and then over time they develop the curricula and they have textbooks and now they've figured out what those abstractions are. And there's really a field called computer science and it's not those other fields at this point, right? It has related, of course, but it's not, um, yeah, it's different. So there's a next question here, which is, um, are there any plans to evaluate what is working and what is not working in these areas, uh, these newly developed programs or tracks outside of the standard course evaluations or anecdotal evidence? And I wonder if, you know, Sophia or Bob or Thomas, if you've built those into or you're starting to think about how to build them into the programs that you're planning. For, for us, it's a bit early, but we are, it, it's something we want to do. Um, I think it'll make more sense after uh, one or two years where we get going to, to formalize that, but it's definitely something we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
and within our center, we have an education working group um, that's focused on what works for our environment. Um, but yeah, it's something that we definitely try to use an approach um, that Diane Franklin uses at University of Chicago, which is to, to have three year education projects with the first um, kind of being a sense finding, the second being a pilot, and then the third year being implementation. So we're just we're just now in the first year of trying to figure out what we want to do, how we want to do it, and how many students we can affect in this way. Uh, when I proposed my program, you know, a certain amount of the paperwork uh, was coming up with an assessment plan, you know, which has. Uh, various things in it, uh, student learning outcomes, um, job searches, uh, those sorts of things. So we haven't had time to do much yet, but there's okay. there are plans. Charlie, any thoughts to add there? Oh, no, not really. <laughs> because I've, I, I'm, I'm actually in, an, in, a, in, the, in an industrial lab rather than university myself. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, here, here's a question for, for Thomas, um, and it's from Dan Stanford Kern. Um, so he says that at Berkeley, they have um, explored why it is that URM and women undergrads who enter Berkeley with interest in mathematical and physical sciences end up switching to different majors in larger numbers than other such students. Um, he said a survey revealed a big reason was that they didn't see a clear pathway to well-paying jobs and emphasize that the current utility of physics, or, or so, he says, he suggests that emphasizing the current utility of physics in quantum information industry may therefore help retain students. And the question he, he addresses to you, Thomas, is, is your experience in going from, you know, you know at, Har at Howard consistent with that? Yeah, so in general, um, having a, um, for, for black students specifically, from, Family support is a huge piece of that. And a huge piece of that is family responsibility. And one way that students try to augment family responsibility is to find a high paying job as soon as possible. Um, yeah. And that's had some effect on what students can do. But I agree with Dan in the sense that I present quantum as a transformative way for the black community to participate um, and to have access to higher paying jobs, and better opportunities for their family. So in, in a lot of the context of how I present the IBM the HPC Quantum Center, it's for the black community in the sense that our best and brightest students will hopefully be handed off to some of the people on this call, whether it's Professor Oliver or, or Professor Akunumu and Professor Barnes at Virginia Tech such that they can continue their education and then go back home to reach these parts of the country that they're not reaching. Um, but it's exactly the selling point that I sell to young students um, is that this is a way of, of engaging and really accessing high paying jobs that weren't available previously. Yeah, so it's, it's that you know, motivation or the, you know, the, the fact that these are leading to very exciting and high paying jobs. And I wonder, too. I mean, I've seen this at MIT, and I, I wonder if you've seen it at uh, Howard and, you know, at Virginia Tech and Madison, but, you know, quantum is cool, and it's got the cool factor, right, that, you know, students come in, they don't know what it is, but somehow it just has that magic that, you know, this is this is different. It's not the usual thing. It's new. It's shiny. It's, it's awesome. And do you, do you find that, and, and do you think that that's, you know, something that we can leverage to help um, diversify uh, the students that are taking uh, these courses. Yeah, my, my short answer is definitely um, we're trying to, to harness the cool of quantum while we still can. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's also consistent with my personal experience, actually, which maybe is a little bit related to what uh, Will you're talking about. So, you know, when I was an undergrad, a lot of my male peers already had experience with programming. And uh, in some sense, I felt a little bit behind in that respect. And then when we started Quantum, um, you know, that's something nobody had ever seen before. And suddenly, you know, I was better than them. And uh, that's, that's uh, you know, boosted my confidence. I think that's another 
anecdotal, of course, uh, point, but it's um, to, to give students the opportunity early and to make sure we're including underrepresented minorities, female students, etc., so that this doesn't become something that's analogous to having programming experience, which is so male dominated. Um, and then I think there's the psychological feel that these people already know it, even sometimes if they're not, you know, as proficient as you think they are, if you're a student who's never seen this object and someone has seen it before, I think you make up in your mind that uh, you can never compete. Mm. Bob, did you have something? Um, I mean, it's certainly true that whenever we offer a course in quantum computing, um, a surprisingly broad audience is attracted and we get, you know, we get great enrollments. Yeah. Um, so that, that part of it is certainly true. But uh, I have to say, there are a lot of male faces <laughs> and not mm -hmm. many female ones so far in those courses. Charlie, your hands up. Yeah. Well, yeah, speaking of programming and computer science, I think it's what the, the history is, and one of those graphs that, that Thomas showed there uh, was that there was a, a big increase in w women in computer science, what was getting on towards 20 or 20 or 30 years ago. And I remember when that happened and then it sort of petered out. So I think this shows how progress can happen, but then it's kind of a fragile and unstable and you have to keep, keep your, your mind on it. Uh, and I think there is this, this, it's a sort of a bi-stable situation because if it feels like a, a, a a field that that there's other people who look like you who are in the field and they're enjoying it, then you get more. And if 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 that lapses for a little while, then you can just slide back to where you were before. It's an interesting point. Yeah. So we have to be diligent as we do this for sure. So we're we're getting towards the end of the allotted time here, and I, I wanted to give each panelist an opportunity to say a few final words. And so may, maybe let me go in reverse order. But uh, Thomas, would you have anything to to say before we close here? I um, no, just to thank the organizers uh, for such a great panel. I'm honored to be on this panel, and more than happy if I haven't reached out to to the people in the audience yet. Expect an email from me and the IBM HBCU Quantum Center at some point on ways that we can work together um, to help as many students as possible. Well, thank you, Thomas. We're really glad to have you as part of this panel. It's our honor and our privilege. Um, Bob. Uh, I guess not much, Will. I thank you personally for uh, putting this together. And I'm, I'm glad the NSF is, uh, uh, is paying attention to this field. And I'm uh, happy I've learned a lot today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for participating, Bob. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, Charlie, last words. Oh, thought. well, I've been very excited by this and how many people are, and how many good ideas there already are about uh, about a field that I find very exciting and, and how to, uh, I haven't actually looked at Terry Rudolph's book, but I'm, I'm really heartened and I probably will try to get in touch with some of the other uh, panel members to catch up on, on what's already been done. Well, th thanks, Charlie, for participating. And I, I always love to hear you talk about quantum. <laughs> um, and, and Sophia, thank you for the keynote uh, speech. Uh, any final words? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, I just want to reiterate that uh, you can teach a lot without linear algebra and without formalism. And uh, I really think it's the way to go at early ages. And you know, I don't have formal evaluations to show, but um, my experience with students, young students, is that uh, they're very receptive to it. Great. So yeah, and thank you for organizing this. It was great. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so so yeah, Sophia, Charlie, Bob, and Thomas, thank you again for participating. I, it was a great discussion. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Lincoln. Thank you so much. What a fabulous panel. I'm so impressed with all the speakers and ideas, and I'm pretty excited to write a paper that could really have an impact on creation of a discipline of quantum engineering at the undergraduate level. I, I noticed that there really is a gap. You know, I wasn't totally convinced coming in actually, although you know, uh, I was one of the organizers designated to make this all happen, but um, actually 12 of us, we had a lot of debates. And I think after this meeting, I don't know how you all feel, but I, I do think there's a noticeable gap between the laudable you know, Q through 12 efforts 
and you know the master's degrees, which are starting to really take off. So exactly how we fill in that gap, I mean, we'll try to put into this paper. Please send your ideas through the Google Doc or directly to me or any of the organizers. Uh, we'd be happy to receive them. Uh, we're, we're very, very pleased at the level of uh, dialogue, uh, you know, 100% for and completely skeptical, all the kinds of dialogue uh, that happened in this Google Doc and in this meeting, and that's exactly what we need to make a science and engineering happen. Um, so uh, I guess we're gonna close now, and I just wanna say thanks a lot for being here. Uh, we had about 250 people sign up to 60. At any given moment, we had up to 150 or so in the meeting and typically about 100, which is pretty great for an online meeting after doing DayMop, <laughs> which had 4,000 people sign up for instead of 1,200, but then any given moment, you may have only a few hundred online. Like it's very confusing how to do online meetings. So I particularly appreciate the way this one happened. And I think it's a nice example of how a workshop can happen online, that there needs to be more discussion and panels for it to even work at all. And it's kind of making me rethink my teaching, honestly. So thanks for that, guys. And uh, yeah, with that, I think we'll close. We're gonna start the, um, the closed session at, uh, I guess that is 4.10 in Eastern time. Am I saying that? Yes, looks like. Um, so we'll get a nice little break. Um, I really want to thank uh, NSF for helping this happen uh, by you know, uh, getting in touch with the Vice President of Research at School of Mines. I think the, uh, the, the announcement is official now, is going to be the director of DARPA. So I, I think um, that's Stephanie Tompkins. So I think this is you know, pretty exciting that a lot of people in the government who um, are in a place to really have an influence are pretty excited about quantum engineering. There were people from uh, DOE, from DARPA, uh, from NSF, from ARO, from AFOSR, all attending this meeting at various points and hearing what we're having to say. So I know we haven't talked a lot about funding, but I encourage you to um, pursue funding opportunities with these various agencies who are pretty enthusiastic about quantum engineering at the undergraduate level, its impact that it can have on everything from diversity to rethinking how we teach quantum mechanics itself. And uh, with that, thank you so much. And I'll see you folks in the closed session shortly. Perfect. And just to reiterate my thanks, um, thank you to William, our moderator, and Lincoln, uh, and all of the panelists and all the organizers. And we will see you in the next session. Thank you, Kendra. <laughs>